spoiler alert, uh, the choir will be singing later. I thought that uh, we would all be joining, uh, I thought that I would be joining them there uh, uh, in the song, but uh, for coming in late for the practice, I guess they left me here alone <laughs> to do the service, to do the uh, message for today. My name is Roy, uh, some of you don't know me. It's uh, Roy for short, and it's Roy for long. <laughs> Truly, God is amazing. Um, this, uh, today, we are just continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount. Some refer to it as the greatest sermon ever preached because it came directly from the mouth of Christ himself. It was directed primarily to those who believe in Jesus or even to those who claim to believe in him. The sermon started with what we know as the Beatitudes, uh, beautiful attitudes or virtues that should mark the, be the lives of believers. And with each one, there is a declaration of blessing. He says, blessed are you because you will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you because you will be called sons of God. Blessed are you because you will be filled. You will be comforted. All these blessings God had promised to us as we live our lives in him. As believers, we all desire those blessings in our lives. Have we all been blessed? But that blessedness was not only meant for us, but something that must meant to be shared to others as well. That was why Christ called us to be salt and light. Let us not hoard these blessings for ourselves, but let us show them to the people around us and let us spread the blessing to them. Even as Christ said that, okay, you, uh, I'm even, even as of Christ it was said that through him, the rest of the world will be blessed. And I pray that even as God blesses each of our lives, that it will also touch the lives of the people that God brings in us. Salt and light, we are to be instruments of God. Uh, influencers, not in the usual sense that the term is used today in social media, but that by our life and our deeds, our blessedness shines through. And it shines the light not on ourselves, but on God and His excellence. And it is not for acclaim or recognition or nor for any worldly gain, but for God and for His glory alone. That's why in Matthew 5.16, in, uh, the, in the sermon that Pastor Dan preached uh, last Sunday, he mentioned, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So let us not be like the salt that has lost its taste, or a light that is hidden under the basket that benefits no one. Jesus said that your others see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Good deeds are works of righteousness, and these are rooted in what God has revealed and commanded us as recorded even in the Old Testament. Now, we will look closely at what Jesus had to say about himself, the believer, and God's laws. Shall I, could I request everyone to rise as we read in honor of God's word? Our verses for today, Matthew 5, 17 to 20. Um, you can follow along silently as I read. He says, do not presume that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever nullifies one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness far surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, 
you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You may please be seated as I pray. Our gracious God, our heavenly Father, truly we are grateful, Lord, for your word. And Father, I pray that you would speak mightily to us, O oh Father, that in your voice, O oh God, that you, in your own voice, Father, that you will impress upon us, O oh God, the lessons that we could learn, lessons that we could glean from your word, Father, to know what you, it is that you desire in our life, to know what it is, Lord, that you have accomplished for our life. And so, Father, we pray and commit to you this time and give you all the honor and give you all the glory. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The law and the prophets, they refer to two of the major divisions of the Old Testament. The law, typically this uh, refers to the first five books of the Old Testament, also known as the Torah or the Pentateuch. Now the prophets consist of the books of the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and also the minor prophets, and could also include some historical books like Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and so on. Now these, plus the poetry books, Psalms and Proverbs, which we are all familiar with, make up the entire Old Testament. Now when Jesus said these words, it was on the early stage of his earthly ministry. He was just entering on his work, and it was, it was important that he state what he came to do. His teachings were in opposition to those of the scribes and Pharisees. And some might charge him with an intention to destroy the Jewish laws and to abolish the customs of the nation. He assured them that he did not come for that end, but rather to fulfill or accomplish what was in the law and the prophet. And so he said, I, I did not come to abolish. I did not come to disregard the law, but I came to fulfill the law. And Christ fulfilled the law. Christ will, um, the theologian Charles Hodge wrote, the progressive character of divine revelation is recognized in relation to all of the great, uh, all the great doctrines of the Bible. What at first is only obscurely intimated is gradually unfolded in subsequent parts of the sacred volume until all the truth is revealed in its fullness. Progressive revelation is the doctrine in Christianity that the sections of the Bible that were written later contain a fuller revelation of God than the earlier section. You see, God not, could not um, reveal everything at once. So slowly, as he spoke to the prophets, spoke to Moses, to the patriarchs, to Moses, and to, on to the other prophets in Israel's history, God was slowly revealing his plan. Thus, the Old Testament is not a sufficient revelation because it is not complete. It's not a complete one. It could not contain all truth because when it was written, the Jews were not capable of receiving all truth. So it is not because the Old Testament is untrue. It's just that it contains um, partial, partially the truth that God wants to reveal to his people. Now Christ fills up the deficiencies of the Old Testament revelation. In this sense, he fulfills it. He does not only fulfill the prophecy by doing what was foretold, but he makes the whole revelation of God perfect by filling up what appears to be gaps in the Old Testament. So as Christ, I mean, he said that Christ was the fullness of God's revelation. In Christ, we find uh, he completed everything that God desired his people to know. Now, Christ fulfilled the law also by his own personal and unbroken obedience. The law had never been perfectly kept till Christ came. He was absolutely faithful to it. He came to fulfill all righteousness by perfect obedience to the letter and the spirit of the law. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says there that God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. God was perfect. Christ was perfect. He embodied the perfect obedience to the law. And in 1 Peter 1.19, it says, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish 
or spot. Now, Christ fulfilled the law in his person. In, uh, a few years ago, in 2021, here at BCI, we devoted the entire year on the theme, Preaching Christ Through the Bible. Each book in the Old Testament, and of course in the New, speaks of Jesus. In Genesis, he's spoken of as the creator, the seed of the woman. He was the Passover lamb in Exodus. He was the high priest in Leviticus. He was the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire by night in Numbers. He's the prophet like unto Moses in Deuteronomy. He's the judge and lawgiver, our kinsman redeemer, the seed of David, faithful scribe, our advocate, our mediator. In Psalms, he is our shepherd and so on all the way until the end of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was revealing Christ. Each book of the Old Testament was revealing Christ in pieces to Israel. Now, Christ accepts the prophecies of the Old Testament as divine and points to himself as their fulfillment. In Luke chapter 4, 16, verse 21, when... Uh, Christ was sort of first spoke in the synagogue. He read from the book of Isaiah. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So it was a prophecy regarding the Messiah. And when he sat down, uh, then continuing on, in verse 20, he says, Then he rolled up the scroll, returned to the attendant, and sat down. And while everyone's eyes was on him, he began by saying, Today, Scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So he was sort of declaring to the Jews in the synagogue that that day, they were seeing the fulfillment of the coming of the Messiah. And that was himself. Also in this encounter with the Samaritan woman, the woman said, uh, in, this is recorded in John 4, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. In John 5, 39, it's mentioned there, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Here he was speaking to the Jew. You search the scriptures, and all this time he was saying that all the scriptures is talking about himself. And then in Luke 24, 25 to 27, this was after the uh, resurrection. And he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets had spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So even the scriptures testified about the coming of Christ and even Christ himself did mention that, okay, all these things are pointing to him. The books of the Old Testament contain many passages about the Messiah, prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ, in his incarnation, the virgin birth, his life, his suffering, his death and resurrection. And the thing is, there are still more that will, are to be to fulfilled when he comes again to reign. So Christ was a fulfillment of the law. And Christ affirmed the law. To affirm means to uphold, accept, or confirm the validity. The words of Christ reveal the historical continuity of Christianity and expresses the unchangeableness of the divine word. He said in verse 18 of our passage, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. They mentioned the word there, the jot or the yod or the iota or 
the key there is that, okay, nothing in the word needs to be overwritten or so overlooked or could be changed until everything is accomplished. The scribes, the rabbis and the scribes had to be extremely cautious in writing so as not to cause one letter to be mistaken for another. Such a mistake could turn a divine truth into nonsense or a blasphemy. So they were very careful about recording the word of God. So the meaning is obvious. Nothing truly belonging to the law, however seemingly trivial, shall be disregarded or forgotten until it has done all that it was meant to do. In our verse, it says, until all is accomplished. I think we should need to take a look a little closer at what it meant. The Bible speaks of the Old and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant, the Old Testament, was a foreshadowing of the New, a foundation of the things to come. The Old Covenant pointed to the Messiah or Savior who came in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus instituted the new covenant at the Last Supper before his death. This cup that is poured out for you, he told his disciples, is the new covenant in my blood. Now the Bible also says that the new covenant is superior to the old. In Hebrews 8, it says, but in fact the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator and superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better purposes. This was speaking about the priesthood of Christ. He was saying that the priesthood of, I mean, the priesthood that was established in the Old Testament, Christ's priesthood is superior to that. In verse 7 it says, For if there had been nothing wrong with at that, with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. So it recognizes that the old covenant had its failings, but the new one is superior. And in verse 13, this is also crucial, he says, by calling his, this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Historically, Christian theologians have recognized three different types of laws in the Mosaic law, in the Old Covenant. They are the moral, ceremonial, and civil. Moral law is the law which reflects God's character and his design of this world. Examples of this law would uh, include, and not limited to, say, you know, the Ten Commandments, commands regarding murder, children honoring and obeying their parents, laws about adultery, covetousness, and theft. In Matthew 22 to 30, 37 to 40, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your hearts and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he said that all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So Jesus Christ himself did affirm okay, the existence of those laws and the need to obey and to honor those laws. And we said this, um, even said in verse 19 of our passage, therefore whoever nullifies one of the least of these commandments and teach, teaches others to do the same shall be called least, in the, uh, least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. These words teach us the permanent authority of the moral principles of the Jewish law. The moral principles of the Jewish law. As kingdom citizens, we still have the obligation to keep God's morals, moral laws. We have, we have to recognize them. We have to obey them. And not only to keep and obey them, but also to teach others as well. Now there's a second kind of those laws in the Old Testament. These are the ceremonial laws. This set of laws that God gave to Moses that were specifically for the nation of Israel as a theocracy. These laws were meant to show God's holiness and the holiness he expected from his people. 
to remember his past actions, and to point to the future Messiah. These laws dealt with the qualification of priests, requirements of how and when to offer sacrifices, cleanliness laws, dietary laws, festival laws, and some would even argue tithing laws. Now, the ceremonies and sacrifices in this sanctuary system were just types and shadows of Christ. And when Christ's redeeming work was completed, the new covenant had overshadowed the old. In Hebrews 9, verses 1 to 10, he says, Now the first covenant, which is the old, had regulations for worship and also an entire earthly sanctuary. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. So God's word was saying, okay, these were all in place and had to be observed until the time of the new order. So when, the, when uh, the new order, when Christ had completed all these sacrifices that were foreshadowed in the Old Testament, there was no longer any need, there was no longer that need for the observance of some of these ceremonial laws. In Hebrews 7, 12, he said, For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. Christ is now the new high priest and the only mediator between God and man. In 1 Corinthians 7.19, 7, 9, yeah, 7, this is about the practice of circumcision. Uh, Paul said, circumcision is nothing and uncircum uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's command is what counts. You see, in, uh, also mentioned in Colossians 2.11, when you came to Christ, you were circum circumcised, but not by a physical procedure, Christ performed spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. In Colossians 2, 16, 20, 16, to 20, uh, 16 and then 20 to 22. Sorry, I don't think I completed everything. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Since you died with Christ to the ele elemental spiritual forces of this world, why as though you still belong to the world, do, not, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. So the passages above confirm, that the New Testament uh, confirm for the New Testament Christians that the old covenant has been replaced with the new covenant of God. And it is abundantly clear that the ceremonial laws of the old covenant have all been done away with in the new covenant. Christ has made the ultimate sacrifice once and for all. Animal sacrifices were no longer needed. Now for the civil and judicial law, all nations must have civil laws to help deal with disputes between citizens as well as to enforce the morals of the people. While not all of the Mosaic civil laws dealt with moral issues, a great deal of the civil laws for Israel did in fact deal with how to punish or make restitution for violation of God's moral laws. So in what ways were the enforcement of the civil laws affected by the new covenant? In the practice of these judicial laws, the new covenant would have not ab abolished the old laws, but even raise the bar as far as believers are concerned. So instead of the old law that says an eye for an eye, believers should strive more for forgiveness, for restoration, compassion, and above all, love. The old covenant specifically refers to the Mosaic covenant that God made with Israel when he found, formed them as a theocracy. The first covenant centered on the people of God as an ethnic and physical nation, Israel. The new covenant would expand the people of God beyond any ethnic group or national borders to include a whole world of believers and worshipers of God. There is no more any distinction between Jew and Gentile because God's kingdom encompasses So Christ did not only fulfill the law, 
he affirmed the law. But Christ also expounded the law. When I was first writing this, I said, uh, I was thinking God, Christ fleshed out the law. He lived it out as it should be um, lived by believers. In verse 20, he says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness far surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Scribes and Pharisees, these were the authorities at the time. The authorities who sometimes, okay, Christ mentioned that they do adhere to the letter, but not to the spirit of the law. That sometimes they override even the letter of the law by some authorized traditions. They added on to what was required in the Old Testament. They would focus more on the formal and external rather than on the righteousness that comes from within. They would desire the praise of men than of God. They lowered the standard of righteousness to the level of man's practices. I mean, things that are more practically practical rather than raising the practices of man to the standards which God had fixed. Actually, in the section that follows after this passage, which will be expounded, I think, in the next sermon, in the sermons in the next uh, few weeks, Jesus would often say, "You have heard it said." Like he said, "You have heard it said, thou shalt not kill." But I say to you, he would say, and then he would mention the things that God did expect for men. He said, but I say to you that even if you express a word of anger or call somebody a derogatory, uh, I mean, a fool, that you are already guilty of murder. And on and on he would mention all these things, things that the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees had taught his people in contrast to the things that God really desires for his people. Christ not only corrected the fallacies in their teaching of the scribes, but also the error in their ways. In one of his other sermons, Jesus denounced the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. Actually, a whole chapter was dedicated to, those, to that particular um, message in Matthew 23. Jesus said to the crowds, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, be careful not uh, to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. That's in Matthew 23, verse 2. In verse 5, he said, Everything they do is done for people to see. They love the place of honor at banquets and most important seats of the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect. They want to be called rabbi or teacher. In verse 13, he said, You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves will not enter, nor will you let those enter who are, trying, who are trying to. So in some ways, the Pharisees and scri scribes and Pharisees were sort of became stumbling blocks even for some of the people who desire to know God. In verse 16, he said, they were referred to as blind guides, blind fools, blind men. In verse 23, he said, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. In 25, you clean the outside of the cup, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. In verse 27, you are like whitewashed tombs, clean on the outside, but full of dead men's bones in the inside. You appear, you want to appear as pe to people as righteous, but the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So the teachers of the law were not even good examples for the believers. So when Ma, in the end of, uh, sorry, in Matthew 7, verse 28, he says, When Jesus had finished saying these things to the crowd, they were astonished at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Maybe you may think that you are better than the worst of them, the Pharisees. 
Or maybe you may even think that we are better than the best of them. But the Bible tells us very clearly in that, in that uh, verse, we can never be good enough to enter the kingdom of heaven. In Romans 3, verse 20, he says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So even he says, righteousness, we can never, I mean, sometimes we may think that we are righteous, but God's word tells us that we are not. In many places, God just tells us that on our own, we could never earn a place by his side, a place in heaven. No one is declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. So we know that we, God demands that we be obedient to the things that he commanded to us. But being obedient alone will not be sufficient for us to earn a place in the kingdom of heaven. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for we know when we have heard this often, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. A Pharisee, a member of the Jewish council, came to Jesus one night and addressed him as rabbi, and acknowledging that he has come from God because of the signs and miracles he was doing but Jesus told him very truly I say to you no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again so it is not enough knowing about Jesus or trying to feel fulfill the law on our own but it is no only knowing him and by faith receiving him as Lord and Savior will we be born again that His righteousness will be imputed on us. Not a righteousness of our own, but Christ's righteousness that will be for us. It is only then that we have a relationship with God and one day enter into the kingdom of God. By all accounts, that Pharisee became a believer and a true follower of Christ. Now, if you have not made the decision to trust God and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, do not let this opportunity pass. So let us come 